Welcome back. How is lunch? Mi gente. How's lunch? Good. Excellent. It is now my privilege and honor to present this year's Latina Excellence Award. As many of you know, the Latina Excellence Award is presented to a visible Latina that serves as an advocate for the needs and the talent of the Hispanic community. It's a Latina that has broken professional barriers and that inspires and uses her influence to help other Latinas, to bring them along. She leverages her power to improve the lives of every Latina, both young and experienced. We have someone with us today who might live in Dallas, but her reputation as an entrepreneur, as a philanthropist, and as a thought leader is known around the world. We present this year's Latina Excellence Award to Nina Vaca, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Pinnacle Group. An impassioned leader, a driven CEO, an inspiring entrepreneur, an energetic philanthropist, a visionary chairman. Nina Vaca is the CEO of Pinnacle Technical Resources, one of the nation's fastest growing firms in its industry for seven consecutive years. Pinnacle was honored by AT&T in 2011 as a top global supplier and by the National Minority Supplier Development Council as its Supplier of the Year. Today, Pinnacle employs over 4,000 employees across the U.S. and Canada and has a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue. So describing her leadership style from a corporate CEO standpoint, I would use three words, relentless, persistent, and effective. And really she has done a marvelous job of representing the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce all across the, the country for sure and probably around the world. In 2010, Nina Vaca became the first woman in several decades of USHCC history to be elected as chairman of the board of directors. But blazing that trail was just the beginning. Nina's mission started with a vision, a commitment to excellence, and a passion for the entrepreneurial community. For many, reaching this milestone would be a notable feat, but for Nina, it was a platform to do more as a national advocate for entrepreneurs. Nina's goal during her tenure at USHCC was to help others take their ventures to new heights and to provide Hispanic enterprises nationwide with a greater voice in the national business dialogue. This is a true passion of hers to lead by example and create wealth within the entrepreneurial community. What people really like is a keen attitude about trying to integrate their business to make it better. And that's the advantage and the competitive point that Nina has. She walks in, she understands about her business, she knows the competition, and she's willing to fight even harder. Nina has been featured on CNBC, Fox, Univision, and Inc. 500 advocating for entrepreneurship. In the public arena, Nina has worked tirelessly to make the USHCC Board of Directors more diverse because she is determined to strengthen the relationships between Hispanic business owners and our nation's top corporations. Confidence, says Nina, along with walking the talk, goes a long way. But Nina doesn't just walk the talk. She swims, bikes, and runs too. A triathlete. Nina raised $25,000 for the USHCC Foundation for the Education of Young Entrepreneurs. In two short years, Nina Vaca broke down the barriers and opened doors to change the image of Hispanic business nationwide. However, Nina will be the first to acknowledge that these accomplishments are collected. Nina is known and respected in every corner of this nation, um, from CEOs and the largest corporations uh, in the country in Nina's own words, 
when you're on the right path, the whole world conspires to help you. Her story of success would not be possible without the dedication, hard work, and contributions of our Pinnacle family. As once said, if you surround yourself with extraordinary people, you will accomplish extraordinary things. I simply would like to just take a moment and say thank you. Thank you so much. It, what an honor and a privilege to be standing here. I know we've been working on this a long time, but it's really a privilege and an honor for me to be here with Alpha. Alpha is no stranger to me, and it is no stranger to this country. And to see with my own eyes the power of Alpha and how much you have grown, it's truly an honor to be here. Charlie and I have known each other for a long, long time, and we had a conversation before he began. And he told me, you know, so I'm thinking of doing something a little crazy with my life. He said, making money is easy. Making a difference takes courage. Charlie, congratulations for what you've done. And you know, behind every amazing man, there is always a woman. In this case, two women, I always say, rolling their eyes. No, I'm kidding. There's, there's women, and as I look around, and I have to acknowledge, it cannot be denied that the chairman of the board, Yvonne Garcia, and the chairman of Women of Alpha, our wonderful Elana Musa, have, have been an incredible contributors to what you see today. Look around, ladies and gentlemen. These two women need to be recognized. Thank you. So I've been asked to spend some time with you and do something very unique and very different, and I have agreed, because I think there's power in just that. Having a candid, honest, unplugged, truthful conversation, opening our hearts and minds, and hoping to inspire all of you. So thank you. Joining Nina on stage is uh, Maria Santana of CNN. We're delighted that Maria is joining us. She is a New York-based anchor and correspondent for CNN, a very versatile, bilingual, and highly respected journalist, and we're thrilled to have her here joining Nina on stage. As a CNN correspondent, Maria has been the driving force behind CNN's and Español's Director USA, and she was nominated for Outstanding Newscast in Spanish. Her peers have recognized her for her coverage of the election of Pope Francis amongst her network. So please join me in welcoming Maria Santana. Hi, like Latinos do. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How are you? Everybody enjoying themselves? <laughs> awesome. I am truly honored to be here today. This is my first Alpha event, and I am amazed and just completely impressed by this organization, and more impressed even by this woman <laughs> sitting right here next to me. I mean, that I get to share the stage with her is truly an honor. So thank you, and thank you for spending uh, this time with all of us. Um, you know, I want to personally thank you on behalf of Bank of America and Alpha for taking the time to do this, uh, to share your amazing story. I've been getting uh, to know her a little bit in the past 
few days, and I can tell you I'm in awe. I just <laughs> want to, you know, see how we can do something through osmosis and get a little bit of that leadership that she has. It's, it's very powerful, very wonderful, and that your woman is amazing, isn't it, girls? <laughs> 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 you know, uh, we are all so proud of your accomplishments. Uh, Congratulations for this very well uh, deserved award, um, Woman of Alpha Excellence Award. Uh, and, you know, I am a true believer in the art of storytelling. And, I mean, that's what I do for a living. I tell stories. Uh, and telling stories as a means of learning and given your story, I'm sure that you agree. So, with that said, I would like to start by asking you to please walk us through your personal story sharing with us key experiences and lessons learned um, along your path to the C-suite. Um, what were some of the pivot points in your career that allowed you to continue moving up? And you know, I really want you to start at the beginning because most people may not realize that your family story is the pinnacle, no pun intended, <laughs> of uh, entrepreneurship in America. So with that, I give you the floor. Well, sure, and as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot of power in, um, in having these types of candid conversations, and I'll do my best to open my heart. You know, a lot of times we hear about people's successes and the video and the, all the successes and the awards, but where the real learning comes from is, quite frankly, from the failures. And I always tell people, it only took me 19 years to become an overnight sensation. <laughs> And you're absolutely right, and you heard it on the many amazing women on the video, that your background is your strength. Your background is your strength in who we are today. So um, like you would imagine, I started with very humble beginnings. My mother and father immigrated to this country from Quito, Ecuador. Any Quiteños in the room? Oh, I love this! Only in New York can I get that kind of reaction from Ecuador. I love this. I'm ya estoy at home. Estoy entre familia. So con sabor, verdad? So my mother and father immigrated to this country, and they did two things with their lives, like all immigrants do. They don't have relationships. They don't know people in corporate America. They come here, and they galvanize together. So I am a chamber kid. It's no surprise that I've done and dedicated my life to the chamber because I was a chamber kid growing up. My parents became entrepreneurs and civic leaders. And honestly, I've, I've tried to dedicate my entire life to do those two things. Um, I do it with intention and I do it with purpose. But I grew up, um, I grew up in a very young age. I'm gonna try to answer your question because you said, what are the tipping moments? Points, yes. So I'm gonna talk about a tipping moment uh, growing up and in another moment being an entrepreneur and then another moment of being a corporate director because I think that is the definition of my life, right? Those kind of three big areas. Um, I grew up with, uh, by the way, um, one of five children and a very humble beginnings. And I learned at a very, very young age something I'll never forget and something that I use today in the boardroom, in my entrepreneur experience, and that is that it is at your hardest moments where you always find your most inner strength. If you study leaders and you study leadership, you know that it's when the chips are down that you have to be your strongest. It's when the chips are down that you have to think clearest. And a lot of times when the chips are down, it's so easy to take the easy road. It's so easy to feel sorry for yourself. It's so easy to take a different path but I learned at a very young age that when those chips are down, it's at the hardest moments that I think you have to have your most inner strength. The tipping point in the business is every leader will tell you, every true leader will tell you um, that no one gets there on their own, nobody. And if they tell you they did, they're lying. It takes a team of people, a team of people to build anything. And so I've learned that you, when you are on the right path, um, people do, the world conspires to help you, like Alpha's on the right path. And so I've learned that it's people that drive companies. And while I get the credit, um, the truth is it belongs um, to the men and women that helped me build the company. By the way, 
Long story short, Pinnacle, <laughs> uh, in 19 years, I won't tell you the details. I'll talk about the failures later, I'm sure. <laughs> but we're proud to this year have been named, not Latina, the fastest growing women-owned business in America. Woo! Amazing. Congratulations. Awesome. Not and I said earlier that behind every amazing man, there's always women. Well, behind an amazing woman, there's always more women. <laughs> and so I'm delighted to acknowledge women. my Latinas, our chief diversity officer and our senior mm -hmm. vice president, my top ranking Latinas in the company, Sandy Mundy and Jessica Narvaez are here with me today. <laughs> And then the last tipping point about my corporate directorship, which you'll hear more about, but the tipping point there is it happened in New Mexico. Yeah. Mm. I went kicking and screaming to a conference. By the way, 60% <laughs> of leadership is just showing up. I didn't want to go. I had just had a baby. I was nursing. Who wants to, who wants to take two flights to go all the way to New Mexico, 40 minutes from from the airport, I, I thought every excuse not to go. And my mentor said, you're going. And I said, okay. Mm. So <laughs> it was much smaller than this. It was 50 women. And I thought, what am I gonna get out of 50 women? What, what, there's no way. What, what's the, and it, the value hit me like a ton of rocks and I'll never forget it. I went to the conference and I saw a panel and there were three women on that panel. One woman, Linda Alvarado, sat on the board of 3M in PepsiCo. The other woman sat on the board of Anheuser-Busch, who is now the ambassador of Argentina, Vilma Martinez, and the third was Maria Saste. And she sat on the board of Darden and Laidall. And it was at that moment, at that time in my life, that I understood an incredibly powerful thing. You cannot be what you cannot see. And what that conference did for me, it validated the fact that people that look like me can be a corporate director. And from that day on, I said to myself, I am going to do this. Because if they can do it, I can. And I made it my business to befriend them, to study them, to know them, to learn from them. And it only took me 10 years to do it, but the rest <laughs> is history. <laughs> uh, amazing story. And you know, this is why, you know, that's one of the reasons why organizations like this are so important because they powerful. give a powerful, they give young people, or just anybody, a vision of what they can be. People of similar backgrounds that maybe came from the same places that you came from and what you can accomplish. Um, now, uh, just before I move on, I just want to let you guys know I am just as interested about learning about this amazing woman, but I know this is about you and what you want to know. So we're going to do this a little uh, more fluid. Uh, there's going to there's a Q&A portion, but we're not going to wait until the end uh, for you guys to ask your questions. I'm going to ask her a couple of questions, and then uh, we'll interrupt that for a little bit so that you guys can ask questions. There's a couple of mics, I believe, uh, somewhere here on the sides towards uh, the center of the room. And you, if you have a question, just walk up there and uh, you can ask her uh, whatever you want. <laughs> um, so easy so, on me, easy yeah. on me. <laughs> but yes, I'll let you be the tough ones on her this time. <laughs> um, so it, there's the first wow, one. There we go. Woo, there wow, we go. Right no mic, no mic. Um, we'll, we'll do that. He says, what inspires you every day? You know, that's an incredible question. Um, it's a very good question. What inspires me today is the same thing that has inspired me, honestly, my whole life. I grew up at a dinner table where my parents just pounded the fact that we live in the United States of America. And that in and of itself is tremendous opportunity. That we live in a country where we can be anything and do anything if we're willing to make the right sacrifices. And so what inspires me, and by the way, through my entrepreneurial life, that's always been the beacon of, of, of my thought process of the opportunity that we have in this country to be. What inspires me today um, is you. If you look at this audience, it looks exactly like our country. Largely Hispanic, 60% <laughs> women, yeah. with a little bit of everything else in between. I'm just kidding. No, but, but it is it's really true. Look at this room. Look at this room. That's inspirational. I was thinking about it earlier today when I walked in and then I took a bathroom break and I thought, 
this inspires me, the fact that we're mobilizing. And by the way, that we're not all Hispanic. I love the fact that I look around the room, mm -hmm. if there's anything more powerful than women talking about women empowerment, it's the men talking about it too. Mm -hmm. And so what I see here at Alpha is the right recipe. Everybody coming together, recognizing the opportunity, and then going out there and killing it. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about the lessons of your parents and how important it is to know your background, where you came from, what it took for the people before you and uh, you know, your parents and your ancestors to get to where they are. Um, share a little bit uh, with us uh, the lessons that you learned from watching your parents start and run successful businesses. You know, the biggest lesson I learned that failure is okay. Hmm. It's an incredible lesson. I watched my mother and father fail. Um, I, I learned at a very young age no, no 12 year old needs to be described what a repossession means or a foreclosure means. We lost our cars, we lost our homes, we had to move back and forth from the valley. And um, I think it was really powerful because I understood what it was like to fail and I understood that everything's gonna be okay. If you hunker down, you work hard, and you keep on delivering. I learned the value of perseverance in a very deep and meaningful way. Mm -hmm. I learned the value, obviously, of faith and family. And that has served me well today. You know, in 19 years of building a business, again, it's a lot of successes and a lot of awards, but a lot of failures along the way. And I have a different way of approaching failure. When my executives start freaking out, they're like, Nina, how are you always so calm? <laughs> You know, everyone's like, oh, we're gonna lose this, we're gonna lose that, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, or software, no, 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 no. And I'm like, I'm always calm, and I'm like, baby, when you've been at the lowest of the low, nothing scares you, bring it on. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> True. Um, you talk, talk about the hardships um, in, in, in your background growing up, but um, your family was also struck by tragedy in uh, 1989 when your father was robbed and shot in his office. Uh, what is amazing is that uh, during this terrible time, you and your sister took over the business, uh, prepared it for sale, um, and what is even more astonishing is that you were not even in college at the time. Uh, can you tell us about that experience and how that helped shape, shape you as well? Yes, and, and the reason why um, Again, I, I allowed us to go in this place is because I think when leaders make themselves vulnerable, that's when you learn. Um, it was a difficult time for me and my family. It's still a difficult time, a thing to talk about. I always like to look at the positive things um, that can come from tragedy, tragedies. And the reality is that was our tragedy. But everybody has their tragedy. If I could say the word. <laughs> their tragedies in their lives. Uh, it could be uh, a death of a parent, a death of a child, it could be an illness, it could be anything. And again, the key learning there was that I can let my circumstances define me. I could have very easily, and everybody would have understood, by the way, if you at 17, the death of a father turned to drugs, you decided to mm -hmm. give up, you felt sorry for yourself, I, you could have easily gotten that pass. But I learned that it's not what happens to you, but how you react. And the true definition of an individual is the character that comes out in difficult times. And I decided I wasn't gonna let my circumstances define me or my family. But we were going to leverage um, and understand that tragedy could honestly be um, a blessing. Um, from a, not a blessing, it's never a blessing, but it could, I can't even find the words to describe it. I just can't let your circumstances define you. You just can't let them do it. And each of us in this room come from humble beginnings, I'm sure, and we have our own circumstances, but don't let them define you. You define you, not your circumstances. Well said, well said. <laughs> Love that. Um, 
So I'm going to ask one question, uh, one more question. Anybody who has a question of their own, please, uh, you know, there's some mics or raise your hand, and um, I'm going to open it up to a couple of questions before I move on uh, with my questions. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> so uh, by all accounts, you had a very successful career at Computer Development Services, Inc. before launching uh, Pinnacle in 1996. What was the catalyst that made you leave and decide to create Pinnacle? Did you always know that you wanted to run your own company? Daunting task. <laughs> uh, you know, so two things. There were really two catalysts. Uh, the first catalyst is um, I was taught at a very young age. Obviously, I was running a business at 17, and it taught me a lot. And I always like to take matters into my own hands. I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm getting it done. <laughs> I'm getting stuff done. And that didn't work so well in a titular corporate environment. I remember my boss used to, I'd always get in trouble for doing, you know, things that my boss should be doing. And they'd, I'd always find myself in the hot seat and always in trouble. And I never understood. And I would argue back and forth and say, but I made the company money. Why are you mad at me? No, you belong in this box. And so I, I had trouble kind of with that notion. I always knew I'd be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what I'd be doing. Um, but again, I'm here to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. You can paint me as some sort of visionary that knew that the technology industry would, would grow in a generation <laughs> and that you need to be in technology because the index has grown in double digits and all that. But um, So there's that, I'm sure. <laughs> but the real truth is, um, and again, this will tell you my culture, what really led me to starting my own business and what really re led me to moving from New York, by the way, I started my business right here on 40 Fulton Street. Mm -hmm. So New York has a very special place if in my heart. If you can make it here. If you can make it in New York. <laughs> yeah. But the reason I left is because my family. Mm. I wanted to be closer to my family. My family, my, my brothers and sisters and I have an incredible bond. They were in Texas. I was the big sister in New York and I, I, I wanted to build something. I wanted to build a future and create generations of the future for my family and that's mm. the real reason I started the company. Mm. So anybody have a question that I could, uh, yes? Hi. <laughs> if you can. Yes, you can yeah. hear me? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Nina. Great to meet you. My name is Jessica Palacios. I work for J.P. Morgan Chase in our Human Resources Division. Uh, thank you for being here and setting an example for all of us so we can see what we can be. Um, my question is for maybe the people in your life that were not your supporters. Um, maybe it was a comment you know, made on the fly. Maybe it was the way somebody looked at you up and down. I think it's a challenge many women face in the moment, how to handle those moments with grace. If you could please share with us a time that you've maybe overcome, you know, some folks that maybe weren't your biggest fans and how maybe you won them over or at least, um, you know, gained their respect. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. My mother used to say, <laughs> a toda hora y a todo momento con clase y distinción. <laughs> So, I took over, um, I shouldn't say I took over, um, I like to be an agent of change. You saw the video at the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I was a newbie and an individual that walked into a, a room full of people that have been together for 10 and 20 and 30 years. So, um, I wanted to shake things up a bit and uh, I wasn't the most popular. I was running against an incumbent chairman that had, uh, by the way, I recognized the contributions that he had made to the company, or the organization, but I just really felt that there needed to be a change. And um, they felt that they would be there forever. And I wasn't the most popular person at first because I was wanting change and I would imagine a um, lot of jealousy, a lot of, the hardest thing to do is to change the status quo, especially when people are comfortable. Why change? You heard a video of, a, I, I forget who said it, but she said, be comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, I made everybody uncomfortable. And um, not only do they look at you badly, but they literally try to destroy you. But again, my upbringing, I've been through the worst. You cannot destroy me. And if I know I'm on the right path and you paint a picture larger than yourself, the world will conspire to help you. And so how did I deal with that? I didn't let it deviate. I didn't let my personal ego and what people thought of me, because everybody wants to be loved, right? 
I didn't let that deviate me from the mission and the core at hand because what I was trying to do was build something for a lot of people, not a few people. And so I just kept that in my heart and in my mind and I had a tremendous amount of confidence and I let my work and the body of work stand for itself. So when you start doing good and you start seeing the results and measuring the results, people start to say, oh, okay, maybe she is doing something right. So that's the message. The message is do not let what people think of you, don't let the, the up and down stare deviate you. Don't let your personal ego get in the way. Stay focused on the mission. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have one more question from the audience. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. My name is Nana Asiedu, and I'm from Texas Women's University. I would like to thank you for being so inspirational. And <laughs> your success story is such an inspiration to me. I'd like to find out how you're able to maintain such a great work-life uh, balance. Ooh, this is a good one. <laughs> Work-life balance. The mother of four. <laughs> so um, I'll sum it up, because I could talk about work-life balance for several hours on hand. But I'm going <laughs> to sum it up, and I'm going to say something to you that I actually said to the world. Uh, it was a recent interview in Parenting Magazine. And it blew out and it went crazy, because I said this. I had four children in six years. And I'll say this to all women that are mothers. Do not beat yourself up. Somebody else will gladly do that for you. <laughs> it's that. the truth. The, 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 the biggest doubters, and it's ourselves. We're guilty. Oh, my gosh, I missed it. I was doing it earlier today. Oh, I should have brought my daughter. I can't believe it. She's not here. I should have flown her. I should have, mm. should have, should have, could have, would have. <laughs> you can't do that to yourself. You have to be at peace with what you can give. Look, all women, they want to be good wives, good mothers, good servants good of, of, of God. They want to be good CEOs, good executives, good abuelitas, good... I mean, the, the, list goes, the list is like this big. And by the time you're done, there's nothing left. And so... I started beating myself up about missing a birthday, mm. missing a Valentine's, a birthday, anything. I, I started beating myself up, and then I started, and then a friend actually gave me this advice. He said, there's nothing more powerful than a silent example. Nothing. No birthday party, no cupcake, nothing you could have done, no soccer game, no basketball game. Nothing is more powerful than a silent example. And so today when I look at my daughters, and it was so amazing. I was, I was also listening to Olivia's successes and um, where they've been. And, and today, my daughter spends her spring break you know, in a third world country giving back. She runs for president of her class. She's captain of this. She's an ambassador of that. My, all my kids are triathletes, all of them, all four of them. And, and they're doing good, and they're building libraries. I think back, and I think, I'm doing something right. Mm -hmm. Silent example. Yes. I completely agree. I wrote that down, and I'm going to print it out and put it somewhere. Do not beat yourself up. Somebody else will, will do, do that, that for you. you. Hashtag you know, I, silent example, yeah, right? You know, I am printing this and putting it somewhere. Um, you know, I have two daughters as well, a nine and four-year-old daughters. And, you know, I think people like you, like me, you know, we can be very great examples for them to yeah. be strong leaders and strong women. And you know, one of the things I learned uh, with this business, because I travel a lot, is it's quality, not quantity. Mm -hmm. The quality of time that you spend with your kids is going to be a lot more important than how much time you dedicate, because you could be with them all day and they're sitting in front of the television. Amen. So you know, that's my advice, <laughs> my humble advice. Um, uh, before I get to another audience question, you know, uh, one of the things uh, that really uh, scares people when they're about to start a new business is how am I going to fund this? Mm -hmm. Money is obviously, you know, a very important component, if not the most important component. Um, how did you prepare to fund uh, the company? You founded Pinnacle in your one-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. So can you walk us a little bit through that journey? Yeah, well, don't do what I did. <laughs> don't do what I did and just 
like you would in a triathlon, just throw yourself in the water. Um, you know, I was 25 when I founded Pinnacle. Oh, did I just age myself? <laughs> so um, I started a service company. So remember, I didn't have any inventory. I didn't have to have an executive team. Heck, I didn't even have to have a marketing uh, brochure. I had myself. Um, I was very confident. I was very good at my trade. And so I was able to start Pinnacle, um, quite frankly, with I remember the bank required a $300 deposit for a commercial, for a business, um, for a business account, so that's what I started it with. And so um, for me, it was a little bit easier in that the kind of business that I was, um, that I was starting was a service business. And so today, one of the biggest issues we find in entrepreneurship is this access to capital. And much like a lot of key important issues in this country. Awareness is really important. Mm. Um, being aware of what capital, and, and 25 years ago it wasn't sexy to <laughs> be a Latina or have a Latino <laughs> business. So I imagine things have changed by now. Um, so I think it's really important to understand and align where your capital can come from. Mm. Okay. So I'm gonna go to this side of the room now because she's been waiting patiently, go ahead. <laughs> Nina, thank you for coming uh, for this wonderful event. And um, my question is more, I'm originally from Bolivia and I moved here to like around 2004. And I just want to get your thoughts in terms of growth of Hispanics and Latinas here in the United States. Uh, where we are, uh, how much growth you've seen and where do you think we're going? Oh gosh, you couldn't have teed up the ball any better. Uh, the growth of Hispanics in this country has, um, it is the proverbial tsunami that I don't understand why people, some people have not recognized. So most people will tell you the data. A lot of people will say, oh, the Hispanic community is comprised of, you know, 50% of the population of growth, where this percent, this percent buying power, that percent. And I really don't use percentages when I try and get executives or anyone to understand the power of his, the Hispanic community. I say this instead. If you're not related to a Hispanic, you soon will be. <laughs> I'm just saying. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, Madam Chair, are we in trouble? Yeah. No, I wanted to join the conversation because I have a little surprise for you. You may not know this. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But over a decade ago, when I heard you actually tell your story today, I just remembered over a decade ago when I sat on my, first, my very first panel in Washington, D.C., you were the moderator. And just like you explained how you were observing those women and thinking how one day you wanted to study them and be them, that's the same way I felt about you. And what an Aww. honor it is to be on the stage with you today. <laughs> for this wonderful and inspirational conversation that you had. Um, it, it really is an honor to have you here. You have been my role model <laughs> since I took stage for the very first time. So thank you, and I really look forward to having you back at Alpha. So I also time. want to <laughs> thank you. You can Ralph. keep going all day, but I think we're uh, <laughs> running out, we're of, out time. of time. Yes. <laughs> I want to also continue to recognize um, Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. It really is because of um, the support of the corporate partners that were able to be here. And before I go into administrative um, catch-ups, I do want to congratulate Nina once again for your award and for being such an inspiration to so many of us, not just Latinos, but to America in general. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> you guys kill me. I love this organization. I love what you're doing. I love what you stand for. Oh my God. <laughs> I love it. You are the future. Thank you so, so much for having me, Madam Chair. Thank you for everything. It's my privilege and honor.